talk about the man. I want to talk about John Le Carre for a minute or two, uh, author of The Spy Who Came In From the Cold, The Russia House, Constant Gardener, uh, and of course, Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy. When did you first both encounter him as readers or, or as watchers? I'm going to defer to Mr. Laurie on this subject. Who no, why? Well, well, I mean, actually, <laughs> chronologically, it was pro I probably got there before you he did. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Being a year or two older, um, I, I, I mean, as a teenager, I absolutely devoured. I loved, worshipped those. Uh, read and read and read and reread. No, read, reread. You know what I mean. Uh, the, the, the great Cold War novels, Tinker Tailor, Smiley's People. Um, it, it just sort of defined my uh, teenage reading, really. Uh, it shouldn't have done, because I was supposed to be engaged in, in uh, uh, academic pursuits. But this was, uh, there was there was more truth and beauty in, in the pages of Le Carre than almost anything else I could find. And then the, after the... Um, uh, after the fall of the wall in 1990, I, and I'm sure a lot of, uh, plenty of other admirers of Le Carre worried that not only would spies be out of work, but spy writers would be out of work. <laughs> and there would be nothing for him to sink his teeth into. And this was, I think, was his first novel after the end of the Cold War. And to my delight and amazement, uh, he'd found a subject that... Uh, even worthier, if that's possible, of his um, um, uh, extraordinary skills. And I, I just was utterly entranced in, in by this novel. Um, I thought it was the most beautifully romantic story. And I, back then, I uh, impudently imagined myself playing Jonathan Pine. <laughs> So I hate this, this whole experience is fairly painful. <laughs> <laughs> Did the character appeal to you for the same reason that I assume it appealed to Hugh? Yes, um, and we talked about it at length, and it was, it was extraordinary to have um, in Hugh a, a partner who, as passionate and intelligent and engaged in the story um, a, as I could have been, uh, and very rare, because his love and his respect for the material is, is deep and profound. And so we talked about it a lot. There is something extraordinary and romantic about Pine. That he, that, he, that he has the courage to do something I think many of us wouldn't have the courage to do, which is to surrender his identity and take up another um, in service of a cause because he simply believes in that it's morally right. Um, it's that uh, Edmund Burke quotation, the um, political philosopher, who said the, the only thing necessary... Um, for um, evil, for, for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And Pine is, at root, a good man by virtue of his choice. Is that when presented with, um, when presented with, uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but when presented with uh, a situation Aha, it's got situations in it. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. I'm not going to watch it. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> it is a situational drama. Yeah. Um, uh, with, yes, there, there are many, many of us might choose to be inactive or might choose to pretend to look the other way. And he doesn't. Um, <clears throat> I think Martin Luther King said something similar. He said, uh, he who passively accepts evil is involved as much as he who actively propagates it. And, and this is, I think, what we were so, both of us so moved by in Pine, which is really an expression of something very deep in Le Carre, um, which is a, a, um, a moral courage and a bravery, a, be a belief in... in right and wrong. Um, and what's so beautiful about the writing is that actually um, Le Carre understands both sides of the equation. Uh, he understands Pine, he also understands Roper, and he shows you in, in the writing how similar they are, that actually they, are, they, are, they become friends easily because they share a, a frame of reference and a sense of humor and, um, and they enjoy each other's company but they are divided by their moral compass. 
And Roper um, is somebody who has benefited from all the freedoms and privileges of, 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 that come with British citizenship. And he has used those privileges to do the worst things imaginable. And Le Carre won't stand for that. And Pine won't stand for that. And nor will Burr, uh, the character played by Olivia Colman. Um, but the complexity of that relationship and, his, and, and, the, and the subtlety of Le Carre's understanding of, of British culture and, and our identity with it is, is why I think it's so compelling. Tom, you're currently in movie theaters playing uh, Hank Williams. Uh, in the movie I Saw the Light, Hank is one of the great all-time unique singing voices. He has that, that sort of cry that he does when he switches, switches syllables. Um, how does one get that or even try to, to mimic one of the great yeah. singing, American singing voices? It's, it's so interesting um, because Hank is about the, f the furthest away from me that I've ever played, I think, um, or so he seemed. Um, and it's uh, just being here tonight and talking about Le Carre and, and his sophisticated understanding of Englishness was you know, something I could bring to bear as a, as a British passport holder, somebody who grew up in the country, and, and it fascinated me. Um, and a Hank is an American icon, and he's part of the fabric of America um, in, in that I, I truly believe without Hank Williams, the picture of American music does not look the same. In fact, the picture of world mm. music doesn't look the same. Um, uh, Keith Richards re uh, did Desert Island Discs recently, and one of his records was You Win Again by Hank Williams. And he, he, they, the Rolling Stones have publicly acknowledged that they, you know, Hank Williams is one of their biggest inspirations, um, as has Bob Dylan, as has Bruce Springsteen. Um, and uh, Leonard Cohen and um, Johnny Cash, and I think he is a, he's a link in a chain that that sort of created something. He was Elvis before Elvis, um, and uh, what I found so fascinating is that what I saw is a tension within him that I knew less well than than the legend, which is that between his exterior charisma and his private vulnerability. And that that tension was actually what made him a star. Hugh, when you're not acting, one of the things that you do is a, a different type of music, the blues. Um, another, <laughs> another intensely American art form. Um, since we all know that it's, it's, it's really rare for Englishmen to be obsessed with American blues, uh, <laughs> how, how did you decide to make a secondary life out of recording albums and going on tour? And uh, well, because it, because it is such a well-trodden path, I don't feel actually weird. It's one of those times where I don't feel particularly, uh, I, I don't feel responsible for explaining how it is that it seems so ridiculous. I know why someone who's born 5,000 miles away and 80, 100 years later, why, why does this music why did it penetrate my um, consciousness as a teenage boy, younger actually, um, you know, nine, ten, I think probably, and why did I, why is it the music that I listen to all the time, try and play all the time, try and sing all the time? I honestly don't know, I, but I can, th there, are, there are five million um, Englishmen ahead of me uh, who were struck by the same comet so um, let them explain it first. <laughs> um, I just love, it's just something I love doing and an opportunity came up to do it. And, and my first response, being English, was, uh, oh no, I couldn't possibly, you know, because that's, that's what we do. And then I thought, well, this is one of those moments where I could look back and go, how, what, how could I have let that slip through my fingers? The chance to even try that, what, a, what an honor and what a privilege it is to, to delve into that music and be a part of it. I mean, it is, of course, specifically American music, and yet, if you don't mind me saying, it is America's, I mean, there's no way around it. It's America's great gift to the world, yeah. greatest gift of any nation to the world. And on behalf of the world, 
Uh, uh, I graciously accept it. Um, I mean, it really is. And so, I, I, although it is specifically American, it has, like it or not, it has become, it is the world's music. Um, you might slightly resent that, um, but it, it just is. Um, I'm not saying it's the only gift. Of course, the martini is excellent. <laughs> Um, there are many, uh, you know, gifts without number. But I w wouldn't you say, I mean, that's sort of unarguable. It's greater mm. almost than language, I would say, is this music, this, the, the, the feelings and the pleasure and the consolation and the courage that it has given to mankind um, through these sounds and these ideas and these stories, I just find endlessly moving and, and beautiful. And you can, I would actually sacrifice all other art forms uh, including this one, in fact. Um, uh, you know, and ballet, frankly, I've got no... <laughs> but this, this, particular, this particular medium, I just find uh, this way of human beings communicating with each other and telling stories and, 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 and uh, becoming one with each other, I just find endlessly beautiful. And the, seriously, the world, the world owes you a debt bigger than... than well, it's incalculable. So, thank you. And by the way, the, the transferable benefit for me is that when you're waiting for the crew to set up the lights, um, the playlist in the morning on the night manager, uh, courtesy of this gentleman, was um, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> this is the was way... It, this was is, it just this, this album way, on repeat? Was no, this, this is the way an Englishman complains about the sound from my hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very much enjoying your playlist. You mean, you mean turn it down? Okay. <laughs> Who or what is your favorite Shakespeare play or character? My favorite play is currently Othello. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because I've, I've had a long sort of relationship with it. I've studied it at school and I saw it many times with different casts and I've been in it myself um, with Chiwetel Ejiofor, who, I, who was, uh, I think it's fair to say, definitive in the title role. Um, and I think it's such an extraordinary, it's so genuinely tragic uh, in its depiction of the undoing of a truly great man. Um, and uh, I, find it, I find it so sad. Um, but the poetry in it is breathtaking. There's a, there's, a, there's a line he has as an expression of love. Othello says to Desdemona when he makes it on the beach after the after the war with the Turks over Cyprus, um, he greets Desdemona and he says, um, he's so happy to see her that his line is, and let the laboring bark climb hills of seas, Olympus high and duck again as low as hells from heaven, if it were now to die, it were now to be most happy. And it's just like, <laughs> he is, I mean, as a writer, you doesn't, doesn't. Maybe we should kind of stop there. <laughs> <laughs>